Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I am here today at the CZ factory in beautiful Uherski Brod in the Czech Republic, taking a look at some of the cool guns that CZ has produced. And today, we're going to take a look at the whole development history of the CZ Scorpion Evo 3. So, we've got the newest version, the early version, and one of the prototypes. Now, Let's start with the fact that it's called the Scorpion Evo 3. If you're familiar with Czech firearms, you probably recognize that there was an earlier Scorpion. There was the VZ-61 Scorpion in 32 ACP. This really cool little personal defense weapon machine pistol submachine gun thing. Well, this you could call the Scorpion Evo 1, or first evolution. Now, the designers kept working on that. Um, and it didn't really go anywhere other than the 32 version. But in the 1990s, after the establishment of the Czech Republic, they came back to that. They figured the Czech military was probably going to want a submachine gun in 9mm Parabellum. And so they brought out, they brought back out of the archive the 9mm Parabellum version of the VZ61. That was originally the VZ68. We'll have a different video on it, but to put it in context, by the early 2000s, this is what CZ had for a modernized 9mm submachine gun. And this thing's a little bit clunky. And more importantly, it's really expensive to manufacture. It's complex inside. And by, well, CZ submitted this to the Czech Advanced Industry Weapons Program of the Modernization Program for the Czech Army. And it became clear by 2005 or 2006 that this was just, it was not going to be cost effective. It wasn't going to meet the requirements of uh, of a new Czech military submachine gun. Go ahead and put it down there. And so they had to come up with something different. Now, back as early as 2001, a Slovakian designer by the name of Jan Luchansky had started tinkering with a submachine gun design. Not because he expected the military was going to need it, but frankly, because it sounded interesting to him and he didn't have anything else to do. And so why not build a submachine gun? Seems like a fine idea. Well, uh, along with a couple of partners, he put together the design of what would eventually become the Evo 3. CZ was aware of this as early as 2001, um, and, or he started in 2001. CZ became aware of the project in 2004, but didn't need it at that point. Well, fast forward two years, CZ is in a position where they need a modern submachine gun that's going to be cost effective. And they look at Luchansky's design and go, aha, that, uh, that has potential to be exactly what we need. And so in 2007, they purchased the project from him. And at the same time, they hired Luchansky to be the design engineer. Uh, he was something like, the, the design was something like 60% complete of, you know, compared to what it eventually became when Luchansky was brought on board at CZ uh, to finish this project off. And we have one of the prototypes here from very early on uh, what Luchansky's gun was essentially when he came into CZ. So we'll take a look at that in just a moment. So the design continues. Um, Luchansky would actually only end up working at CZ for about two years, and that's a story we'll get into at a later date. But uh, by the latter half of 2009, the gun was essentially considered finished. Now, it had gone from sort of a PDW style of gun uh, uh, in Luchansky's original design to much more of a full-size military submachine gun, now known as the Scorpion Evo 3. So the Evo 2 was the 9mm VZ-61, and now we have the Evo 3. Uh, it is a uh, select fire in its military configuration. They are, of course, exported to the United States as semi-auto versions and are really quite popular as PCCs there, uh, pistol caliber carbines. But in the original, the original design requirement was for a military submachine gun. So it's select fire, including a three-round burst mechanism in the trigger. Uh, fires from a closed bolt, simple blowback, uh, simple cost-effective construction. Uh, and really, it is, I would say, its closest competitor in the market would be something like the HK UMP. Modern, polymer-built, blowback, cost-effective submachine gun. So now, let's take a look at how it actually works starting with the first prototype. Here we have Luchansky's original, well, maybe not his very first, in fact, definitely not his very first, uh, but one of Luchansky's early prototypes. And what's interesting is this is sized really sort of as a PDW, but 
it is almost identical internally to the final finished version of the Scorpion. So uh, we've got our magazine here, which we can put off to the side, and then a side folding stock that just locks out, and that's just tensioned. So we pull it in, and it'll fold. Uh, like the regular Scorpion, oh, I should point out we have a selector switch here. Uh, this is single, full, and safe. The original prototypes didn't have a three round burst option. That is something that was uh, required by the Czech military. We have our charging handle up front, rather like an MP5. So we can lock it open, and the charging handle can actually be swapped from side to side. This is not quite 100% ambidextrous, but this is close to a fully ambidextrous gun. Disassembly is one pin right here. Again, just like the final Scorpion. We pull that out, and then we can lift the fire control group out as a unit. Then we can let the bolt forward, and to remove the bolt, you're actually gonna grab it, pull it back, and lift it out of the gun. So, let's see if I can get this on camera. There we go. That lifts out. We've got a recoil spring locked in place right there. This is hammer fired. So we have the firing pin right there, open pocket in the bolt to allow the hammer through. This lug acts uh, to hit the disconnector or the, the auto trip in the fire control group. And I'm pretty sure that this also acts as an out of battery safety because if the bolt is not fully forward, and I'm hypothesizing here, but I bet if the bolt's not fully forward and the hammer drops, it will hit this lug and not hit the, the firing pin. So that's a nice safety element in the design. And then that's more or less it. The pistol grip is held in place here uh, with a bolt through there and a dovetail block. So you can open that bolt, take the grip off. Uh, a little interesting that the rails on the front of this prototype are very, very close together. I'm, kind of dubious whether you could fit most accessories on here because they interfere with the other rails. Uh, and then very thin plastic walls. This, Frankly, this makes me a little bit nervous to have a part because these are really thin and flexible. But this is like the proof of concept style of prototype. Oh, and sights. We've got a notch sight and two different sizes of aperture but the very, very short stock uh, makes those sights almost useless. It's really hard to get a sight picture through them. This looks like it ought to telescope, but as far as I can tell, it doesn't. I didn't want to really force it. Um, but this is not quite, this is the mechanism that CZ would use for the EVO 3, but it's not quite the form factor. CZ needed a submachine gun for the military. So not something this small, something full size. And this is what they came up with. Now, we have a 30 round double stack magazine. The original magazines were this semi-translucent uh, blue plastic, actually kind of reminiscent, or blue polymer, sorry, kind of reminiscent of the early magazines for the CZ Bren rifles. Um, it is interesting that the, the early uh, polymers here had a tendency to crack in the feed lips. They were a little bit fragile. This would be improved later on. Controls on the Scorpion 3 are a little bit more completely ambidextrous than on Luchansky's prototypes. We have a selector lever here that goes from safe, semi, three round burst, and full auto, and it's duplicated on the other side. The bolt release is not ambidextrous, but what's interesting is that even though it's only on one side, it is actually ambidextrous functional. So if you're left-handed, you can actually hit the bolt release can actually use it very easily with an index finger. And if you're right-handed, you can very easily use it when you load a new magazine. So that control almost doesn't need to be duplicated. The magazine release is down here and is present again on both sides, operated by the index finger. The HK style charging handle is still in use. So 
pull that back to cycle. It will lock open on an empty magazine, like so. And you can also manually lock it open by rotating it up, again, like an HK. And you can take the charging handle out by removing this pin and swap it to the other side. Much like the Bren 2, the stock is both telescoping and folding. You've got a big button here, and that folds over to the side. Uh, makes it really quite compact for transportation. In theory, you, there's no reason you can't shoot it with the stock folded if you wanted to or needed to. Disassembly is done exactly the same way as the prototypes. So you need to have the bolt all the way in the rear, and then we push out this one pin that is captive, that'll stay there, and then I can lift out. There we go. I can lift out the fire control group, the trigger mechanism, and the magazine well. Note how similar these two really are. We have our ejectors, hammers, the exact uh, configuration of the parts in here has changed, so the parts aren't strictly interchangeable. And the biggest difference, of course, is that the production EVO 3 uh, has a three-round burst in it, where the prototypes did not. Uh, probably not something Luchansky really wanted uh, to have to spend time designing. The difference in length here is simply due to this sort of styling uh, that rolls this into the front end of the gun, which wasn't necessary on the original. But if we look at these from the bottom, you can see that the magazine wells are essentially in the exact same place. The bolt is going to come out of the production gun exactly the same way as the prototype. Just pull it back against the recoil spring, lower it down, and pull it out of the gun. Uh, again, the two parts are extremely similar. Uh, slight changes to the mechanic, to the design of the fire control group mean that we don't have this lug on the final production gun. Uh, but they both have, they're both hammer fired, both essentially identical in profile. I can take the stock off by pushing this button in, sliding the stock assembly off the top of the receiver. Again, very much like the Bren stocks. And that leaves me with a polymer receiver, a pistol grip that is once again held in place on the, this dovetail block with a single bolt so the pistol grip can be replaced if one desires. And then we have a barrel with uh, CZ's style of muzzle brake up there at the front, or flash hider. It is interesting to note that despite the difference in overall size, the, re the actual receiver length from this tiny PDW prototype to the full-size production EVO 3 is almost identical. There's maybe half an inch, maybe a centimeter of difference. If we look at the bolts, you can see just a tiny slight difference in the length of the recoil springs. Now, before too long, there were a number of changes and improvements that were made to the gun. Uh, nothing really fundamental, but a lot of little details. And this is the EVO 3 A1. So our very first pattern was the CZ Scorpion A, A for automatic. There was also, by the way, the Scorpion S. That is the semi-auto version. There are a number of internal changes to the Scorpion S. Uh, to maintain it as a semi-automatic only and prevent parts interchangeability with the automatic versions. That's a subject for a separate video. Once we get to the final product improved version, we now have Scorpion EVO 3. It's now fundamentally in the name of the gun, uh, A1. So on the first version, the sights were actually outsourced to Italy. Uh, we have an aperture sight there, windage and elevation adjustable. And then a pretty simple front sight, uh, non-adjustable. All of your adjustment is done on the rear sight. And this is basically a blade, but with a white dot uh, for a front sight. For the improved version, CZ made their own rear sights. They now have four, a choice of four different aperture sizes. We have uh, windage adjustment here on the rear but the elevation adjustment is done on the front sight in a pretty typical military pattern way. Uh, you have a locking pin that's spring-loaded. You push that down, and you can thread this in and out to change your zero. 
So our early gun here is actually still technically a prototype. This is one of CZ's prototype style serial numbers. And on some of these early ones, uh, the grip assembly, or the, the trigger assembly is actually marked designed by Laugo. Uh, Laugo Arms was Luchansky's company that was, well, that's where he came from when he got hired by CZ. You may recognize them from the Laugo Alien pistol that Luchansky uh, designed after leaving CZ. And we also have a Made in Czech Republic uh, marking up on the top of the receiver. The current production guns have gotten rid of the design by Laugo. Uh, they do have a warning read manual note there. Uh, this particular one was manufactured in 2018. Still has Made in Czech Republic. So a couple other variations. On our early gun, we have a pretty low profile selector switch here that has been enlarged on the A1 to stick out more for better grip on both sides. The early guns have this square block on the magazine catch. That was actually removed on the A1. Um, I suspect it tended to catch on things and the magazine catch is really, to my mind, big enough like this as it is. CZ started adding a hand stop as a, a factory option. They make these themselves and that's just handy <laughs> oh, I just made a funny there. Uh, that's handy to prevent your finger, of course, from getting in front of the muzzle because the muzzle is just barely longer than the handguard. And perhaps the most significant change is the introduction of a new magazine. So instead of the original semi, like the translucent blue, we now have a black polymer magazine that is much more damage resistant, it's stronger, it doesn't tend to crack up here in the feed lips anymore. It also has a pair of viewing windows in it. You can't really see anything through these in this view, uh, but when there are cartridges inside, it's, they're, they're pretty obvious. And so those are on both sides, and you have uh, capacity markings on here uh, in increments of five, so 15, 20, 25, and 30. On the very early Scorpions, your sling attachments were a metal uh, bracket right here, and then what is actually basically a sling slot on the back of the receiver. Um, that was not particularly well received or useful. It did also have a sling bracket here, although this is polymer and it had a tendency to crack because it was relatively thin. So the A1 version got rid of that kind of weird flat bracket altogether and made this one significantly wider, about twice the width. So that's now your single rear sling connection. And of course, it's ambidextrous. So there's one over here as well as one of the front mounting points. The design of the charging handle was also changed. This is really a very subtle thing. So we have the early one here that is a little bit more sharp and hooked, um, and that was replaced with a kind of slightly more squared off version. Um, I assume this, again, had a tendency to catch on things, and so they modified it just a little bit. On the early guns, there was a mechanism for locking the stock in place, which was basically a polymer lug here that snapped into this recess in the receiver. And well, this one, it doesn't really work anymore, uh, which may be an indicator of why they changed that as well. And on the A1, they actually went to a magnet. So there's a little magnet in the stock there, which connects to the serial number plate in the receiver. And holds it in place. Um, that's a really good application for a magnet. It doesn't, not much force is required. There's no button or anything that you have to push to unlock the stock. You just pull it gently away from the receiver and it opens up. Now, I've never actually fired one of these in its full auto submachine gun form and I'm really kind of curious how it handles. So tomorrow we're gonna take this guy out to the range and do some shooting with it. So stick around for tomorrow's video. Hopefully you enjoyed this one. A big thanks to CZ for giving me access uh, to take a look at not just the current version, but the really cool, really early developmental prototypes. If you enjoy this sort of thing, you'll probably enjoy CZ's own social media. I've got links to all of their connections down in the description below. So check those out and thanks for watching.